Oh, uh, you got there it. we go. Now it's on. We're just we just started the broadcast now, but we're not, we're going to wait a few minutes still. Um, we're just turning it on early because we've had problems um, the last uh, page to stage day that we did uh, with logging in. So, but we've got Richard. Woohoo! Hi, Richard. Um, in in a couple more, so that's good. But we're going to wait like five minutes, so we just got it turned on. And the dog ate the webcam cord right before the class. So Jared had to race to Micro Center and get a new one. Good job, puppy. I'm just going to pin a little bit, but nothing too secretive. I'm going to make nice corners on cups. Right, we haven't started yet. All I'm doing is I've got my um, the back of my shirt and I've gathered the base or the body of my shirt back and I'm just pinning it to my yoke. But I'll show everybody all that shortly. Where's Basil? Basil, are you going to bark? I brought your fake shock collar to psych you out. Pretty soon we're going to just lose everybody that does webinars because the dogs are so annoying. But I can't leave them at home. I just can't. Sometimes I can. But not all the time. How many minutes we got? Is it almost time time? Yeah. I'm going to go blow my nose. Now where we have Kleenex? There's Kleenex over here. Are there still some in the bathroom? Good. We're not out of Kleenex. Hi, Everett. Taylor, you go to bed. You're a bad puppy. Most of the time. We'll probably end up letting her out to run around feral, but no. <laughs> And then I think after the webinar, we'll just kind of clean it up. So it looks cute for a little girl's Christmas tutu party. Hello, hello. We're almost ready to start. Got to get my glass of water. I'm going to put this on this. Is she starting to bark? Should I let her free? She's a pain in the butt. Hopefully the puppy just takes a nap today. She ate the webcam cable, which was just so traumatic. That stinker. Okay, so here's I've got I've got updates and info on this trunk pattern that we've got. The trunk pattern that I've been hunting through every hard drive and every disk and everything ever on all the computers goes back to when I like hand drew patterns and printed out the info and taped it all together and stuff, like back before Photoshop existed. The good news is 
somehow Irma Haas had a printed version of all of this because I could not find my saved one. It was actually um, saved at a printing place in South Dakota that doesn't even exist anymore. So we like tried to find it in email. We tried to find it all over the place and we couldn't. And we're going to actually relist this, this for sale. So Irma sent me a picture of it and we sized it up in Photoshop and I'm working on getting all the different sizes of this done to send to everybody. So, so probably by the end of today, I think I might be able to have that done or on Monday, a Christmas Eve present. But um, what it is, is it actually just makes a man's trunk. Um, so, so you just have, to, we'll, we'll cut this out here in a minute. <clears throat> it makes a man's trunk that you can use as a short or you can use it as something to help hold a shirt down. So we're gonna be using it as something to hold a shirt down. And it's got a line to cut more of a thong cut, which is a little uncomfortable because they, they end up with this little piece kind of like right in between their butt crack. But if you don't want a great big trunk in the shirt or holding the shirt down, you can use this dotted line, makes more of a thong. Or if you want a full trunk, you can go to the longest line down to their thigh. Um, I've also done it where I just kind of go in the middle of it. And I've got this traced in brown paper um, and, and was just so surprised we could not find the file for it. We found the info files for it, but not the actual file. So um, the other thing on this pattern is, uh, like this is a waist 27 to 29. So this is like fitting a waist, like more like a 28 inch waist. Um, it's not super tight because the idea is that it's just kind of there to, to hold the shirt down or to be a trunk over a dance belt. So if you make one of these up and you're like, oh, that, I think that should be a little bit tighter, just make the waist one size smaller. Or the other thing you could do is just fold a little bit out of the center to reduce the waist. Um, but we'll, we'll have notes for that on the pattern um, when we get it all put back together. So everybody give a shout out to Irma for somehow being the one person that had had a copy of this. Um, and the trunk today to hold down the shirt, I've just got like a, a soft, not sheer mesh, but not the heavy panty mesh, but just kind of like some random in-between stretch. But the sheer mesh works, Lycra works, whatever, whatever you want to use for the trunk is fine. Just remember that if they've got tights over it, um, the thinner the better. And we're going to work a little bit first on assembling the shirt that we started with yesterday, the first shirt, and then um, the second shirt that we've got where we started this Mandarin collar. I'm going to show you how to turn that block into the more um, uh, like a Russian, like a Russian cassocky style shirt or a um, just more, more of a peasant shirt without such a fitted armhole. So we're gonna look at making this more of a, um, the, a more basic shirt where the shirt we started with yesterday's got like a nice armhole and cuffs and a full sleeve and stuff. And Katura, who you might see walking by later, she's gonna do some of the sewing with me on this, um, but I'm gonna show you what we've started with. So our pattern yesterday, we didn't have seam allowance, so she's been adding seam allowance to it. Um, and remember, the back of bottom of our shirt uh, is gathered and going on a yoke. So that's where I'm at right now. All I've done is gathered the, the section of my sh shirt base that's going onto the yoke onto the yoke, and I've got it pinned on, so I've got it right sides together, but we're going to be trapping um, this, uh, we're going to be trapping this seam allowance between the two yokes. And then actually our shoulder seam of our shirt, so our front, let me grab the front. When our front goes on, we're going to use our two yokes to actually encase the shoulder seam of the front too. So a lot, so we're going to encase the shoulder seam of the front and we're gonna encase the seam of the back. And then remember, we made a facing. We made a great big old facing. So if you didn't wanna face the whole shirt, when it's time to put the collar on, you could stitch one side of the collar on and then use the collar to catch your neck edges all up um, inside the collar. But we're using a facing because it's a little 
it's a little easier and more theatrical um, approach to do this stuff. So um, I think let's go to the sewing machine. Actually, no, let's set up more sewing. So we're going to be putting on our back yoke, and then we're going to use the other yoke piece to trap that seam allowance. So we're going to trap the seam allowance in there, and then we're going to put our front on. But why don't we um, get a sleeve placket set up, or a sleeve lap, the lap in the back of the wrist? So I've got, we haven't retraced our sleeve yet, but We've got it here, and what I'm going to do is I've got um, the opening. We know that there's going to be an opening in the back of the sleeve. So I am just going to take a pencil really quick, and actually it can go on the right or wrong side because it's going to get finished off. I am going to mark a few little dots right along where my opening is going to be. And we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this little placket with bias. And there's there's another way to do it, um, which if I don't get to, I will send a photo from a book. But so we're gonna do the like the nice, the the more complex way. So let me undo my sleeve. And I'm gonna put, oh, we've already got it. We've got our marks to put our cuff on. That's great. That's great. And we've got our back balance points and our shoulder and our front balance points. So remember, in the armpit, no gathers are going to happen. So this first little sleeve placket that I'm going to show you um, involves a strip of bias. Okay, there's our beautiful sleeve, and I'm going to just deal with one sleeve. So we're not going to put both sleeves in, but we're going to work. We're going to work on one of them. And to make this first placket, the opening at the back of the wrist, we're going to slit the opening first. So we're just putting a straight cut right into the opening, and then we're going to take some some more of our shirt fabric. And I've I found uh, at one of the local places here this really weird, it's like a cotton poly blend something. Um, and it actually has a tiny bit of stretch in it. So it's really nice. It's And it was only $1.50 a yard. So I think I might go buy the whole roll. So I'm gonna just make myself a piece of bias. And this is one of those things, too, that you might want to play with it, like kind of make yourself a sample. Um, I'm going to start with a piece that's an inch and a half wide, and then we'll kind of decide if we think that worked or if it was too wide or too skinny. So I cut two out, so I've got one for later on. I've kind of cut two out. So we're going to be at the sewing machine and we're going to work on the right side of the sleeve, so the good, the audience side of the sleeve. And with this little piece of bias, we are going to run it down one side of the slit, like about a quarter of an inch away. But as we get to the point, as we get to the top of the point, we're going to have to angle our stitch over. Then we're going to straighten the rest of that split out and run the piece of bias down the other side of the split. So it's like you're treating it like it's a straight line, even though it's it's really just a slit. So we're going to be putting the bias down one side of it, and then we're going to roll it over to the inside and do another little fold and stitch it and finish it off so that we've got a really nice little binding there. And you can fold the binding in to make an overlap and an underlap if you want to. Oh, woohoo! Here's Keturah. She's hiding on the other side of the table. There are hands. What I'm going to send her with is our back yoke, actually. So let's look at what she's going to do. I've just kind of gathered this on. to, to So this is the shirt body onto that yoke piece. You're going to just stitch along that edge at a half an inch and just kind of even out the gathers as you go. Okay. Then after you stitch that, 
you're going to put this shiny side down to it. And then from the line that you just stitched, you're going to re-stitch this on. That's good for you. So, good for you. so we will end up with that seam allowance trapped between the two layers. Okay. So that is all yours. Jared, let's go do this little bit of sleeve business. And then we are going to work a little bit on the cuff. Um, and I'm going to show you guys a nice a way uh, to do the cuffs. How to turn the points out really nice. And also kind of a trick for getting the, the bottom of the sleeve gathered onto the cuff. And I don't want to iron my cell phone. I'm surprised the dog hasn't eaten my cell phone. Okay. So let's look at the slit on our sleeve. So we've got the slit here. So I'm going to start by stitching. Oh, the light's too i got to work in the dark. Um, I'm going to start with the right side of my shirt fabric to the slit. And I'm going to have like a seam allowance that's probably a little bit less than a quarter of an inch. Um, and then as I get up to the point, I'm actually going to kind of shift my, I'm going to shift my little piece of bias over to get really close to the point so that I can pivot this and change direction. So the goal is that we get the bias right to that point that we clipped up to uh, without a pucker. So let's see if I can do it on the first shot. I probably can't, um, but I'm going to give it my best. And actually, I'm going to start the other direction because it's easier for me to sew this way. Um, some books have you like pre-press this piece of bias, but then you're kind of like forced to try to like get your stitch exactly on the fold that you ironed in. I like to stitch it on first and then press it because if I don't get my fold just right, you kind of end up with like this kind of puckered thing. So I'm about at a quarter of an inch seam allowance. And then as I get to the cut here, what I'm trying to do is get my needle to go right to the cut and then back out to having some seam allowance. So it's a little tricky because you can't really see what's going on underneath there, but you can kind of feel it. So I'm working right up to that split, right where we've split it. We're going to cross our fingers. Then I'm going to just bend my piece of bias and continue down the other side with the same seam allowance that we kind of had earlier. I'm feeling good. Let's see. So see, I've gotten the stitch right to the corner in there. My stitch is a little long too. So, so far we don't have a pucker, so that's good. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the iron. And first, I just kind of like press both sides of this open. And then we're going to press a little fold into that piece of bias and then fold it up right up to our stitch. And then that's what we're going to continue around. We're going to continue. We're going to stitch that all again. So we're going to catch this little bitty fold right up to the stitch that we already made. So let me press this backwards and upside down with the iron. Um, oh, there, I can get the iron closer. Let's see. Um, so for, you want to kind of get the bias to the inside of the in, inside of the cut cuff. Well, it's not the cuff, the inside of the slit there. And I first like to kind of press both sides open. And even though we're probably going to press them all the same direction in a minute, by pressing it all the way open first, you're less likely to get a weird fold where the seam actually is. White on white on a nice creamy ironing board. Not hard to see it all. Really? It actually shows up? Oh, it actually shows up. Um, so now what I'm going to do is press them towards the bias. So I pressed them both open. And now I'm going to press them towards the bias. So that pressing it open first just makes it lay a little bit nicer when you do the second press. 
and now it's kind of different with each fabric. Now I've got to decide, do I want to fold this first and iron it and then fold it over and stitch it? Or do I want to fold it while I'm stitching it? Um, and I am feeling like I can do the first fold with the iron. But, I, but so you guys know what I mean by like some fabrics, you might want to just do it as you're sewing it. But this one, it, it, with it being a blend, it's a little bit spongy. So I'm going to see how it goes to give it a little press right now. Burn your fingers just a little bit. Oh, look, see, I got it pressed and then I lost part of it. Okay, back to the sewing machine. Do, 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 do. Okay, so, and this kind of stuff too, right? It's like I find for myself sewing it, when I pin some of this stuff, I do a really crooked job of the actual putting it together. I find I have better luck to kind of do it, deal with each few inches of it as I go, because the pins are going to move. So we want to back stitch. So we're just in, here's our original stitch. We're just a smidge to the inside of it. And we're going to straighten this out. So we're, tr we're just treating the split like it's a straight line. So now I want to go down right along there. And actually, where, I, where my original split is, I'm going to clip it so I'm all the way up as high as it can go at the top of the split because it'll be less likely to make a pucker. And if your bias is twisting, just straighten it out so it's not twisting. I know um, some, some directions in bottom patterns have you use a straight piece of goods here too, um, which also works. I just think you have a little more, a little more fudge factor if you have a piece of bias. Right? Was I out of bobbin for this whole thing? No, I wasn't. Hey, I'm like feeling pretty great about this so far. So right now, let's look at the outside of the sleeve. Have I lost what's the inside and the outside? This is the shinier side. Oh, good. So right now, it needs a press, right? We've got this loop put in there. But what you can do is you can actually press this so that it has an overlap and an underlap. And then if you look, if you go in your closet or in your husband's closet or whoever's closet, or lady shirts have this too, you'll see that sometimes there's a little itty-bitty angled stitch there that's helping keep the, the fold of the over and under lap of that going the right direction. So let's figure out which direction it actually should go. And the easiest way I can do it is by actually putting it on my arm. So that's this is the left arm of my shirt. So I want this to be the overlap. Actually, the way we pinned it is right. So I'm going to give that another quick little press. So we've got our overlap and our underlap. You can do a placket in the back of a skirt like this too, but for that you would use a straight piece of goods folded. You probably wouldn't want to use a piece of bias. So I'm just trying to make it meet up as best I can. And then at the top, I just want to try to press it so I don't press in a pucker. But if you get a little bit of a pucker, that's all right. I might use a pin to hold this. Give it a little steam and then kind of like use your fingers to finish it off. Hey, I don't have food on my fingers. That's good. Okay, so we're going to put a little bitty stitch across the top of that to kind of help hold it down. Boot, boot, to do. <gasps> Look, now I'm like, I've run over the mic cord. The dog ate a cord. I ruined a cord. 
You just keep sending Jared to Micro Center. So now I'm going to put just a little tiny stitch. You could even do just a little bar tack right there. But the idea is we want to keep that folding the direction that we want it to. to or overlapping the direction that we want it to. And it's kind of a hump. So hopefully this machine does an all right job. Oh, it does. You can also just go in and put a little tack by hand. Um, but this is a costume. It's the wrist. It's good enough. So we've just kind of stitched that in place. Now we're going to put our underarm seam together before it goes in the cuff because the placket is where the cuff is going. So I'm going to just put this right sides together and stitch my underarm. Maybe. Oh, there we go. For a second, I thought I put the placket in the wrong side. Oh, good. Here, I'm going to um, press them, press it all up. And then I'm going to give you this to surge two seams together here in just a second. So I'm going to stitch my underarm together. And then you can surge this stuff separate and press it open. Um, oh, I, or what we're going to do today is I'm going to have Katura just surge the two together. Because this, uh, this big full sleeve... We're not going to have the issue of like, oh, he needs more room at the elbow or he needs this or that. We're just going to say that it's good and done. And actually, I've got a little bit. I've cut one side just a little bit long on my pattern. I didn't true up my pattern. I should walk the edges together to make sure it all fits, which I didn't do. But I can finagle this down at my wrist. I'm going to be off just like a half of an inch. Whoops, don't tell anybody. I'm off at my cuff. I should have pinned the top, bottom, and middle, too. But this isn't a sewing class. We're just making a shirt. So the little bit that I goofed up on there, I'm just going to trim away. <gasps> That's right. No one's going to know. It's full and poofy. Okay. If you will surge, just surge this together. And then just put it on a sleeve board and press it one direction. So okay. surge that together, surge together and then press it one direction. Okay. And then actually you can surge around the cap of the sleeve, okay. but don't surge around the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. So now we are going to um, work on the cuff since we've sent that away with Miss Katura. So our cuff... The shorter edge is the bottom and the longer edge is the top. And what we're going to do is we've interfaced one side of it. One side of this has been interfaced. And I usually like to say that the interfaced side is what's going against the wrist. Because should your interfacing pucker, we that's why we don't put it on the, on the outside that shows to the audience. So generally we put the interfacing against the body so that if something goes awry um, when you iron or if the interfacing shrinks with dry cleaning and stuff, you don't see those ripples on the outside. So what I'm going to do is put my right sides together of my cuff. And, the, and I'm going to start by stitching a line on my inside. So my side that has the interfacing on the top edge, I'm going to stitch a line right where my seam allowance is and press it over before I stitch around the other edges of my cuff because after the sleeve is gathered in there, having this one edge pressed over nice already helps you, helps you finish off the, the full part of the sleeve into the cuff. So the top edge of the inside of my cuff, I'm going to start by 
stitching, just stitching a line a half inch from the top. And this works on all kinds of cuffs. That was California calling where the mother ginger is. But it's Friday. If they haven't alerted us to something this entire week, right? It's too late. Nothing I can do. Nothing I can do. Okay, so I've stitched that line, and the next thing I'm going to do is just press this edge over. I'm going to press it towards the inner facing so that later on you'll see why we've done that. So I'm not even going to stand up. I'm going to just sit here, fold that over, and give it a press. Did she send me a text? I better look. Oh, well, that's a voicemail alert. I will text I wonder what's in her voicemail. Maybe it's everything's there. Everything is there, or there's still problems. Um, okay, so now we're going to put this back right sides together. And we're going to stitch right over that thing that we folded down. So we're going to just stitch down our short sides, our wrist edge, and then back up. And I'm going to show you a trick to get the corners to turn out really, really nice. So we're going to stitch that with a half an inch. We're going to stitch this with a half an inch. Get the bottom lined up. Okay, so, and I'm also going to take a chunk of another color of thread to help me turn the corners inside out later. So I've just got this chunk of blue thread. You'll see here in two seconds what I'm going to do with it. So I'm coming down my half inch. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Back stitch. And then... I'm going to stick this piece of thread between the two layers right when I get to the intersection. So I'm going to be, I've got a half inch coming each way. I'm going to stitch right to here. And sink my needle. And then I'm going to, oh, I've got a dog here. Then I'm going to slide in a thread. Have I done this wrong? It's been a while since I've done this. You'll need to do one more stitch past. Yeah, that. so I slide in the thread up to the needle, and then I go one stitch past that thread, and then I just move the thread out of the way, right? Yeah, Both to the inside. inside. There, J thank God Jared knows what's going on. So I've doubled this thread, and I've done a stitch past it, and then I move this to the inside. And that will give us something to pull later to pull the corner out nice when we're ironing it. Works good on collars, too. Yay, I'll holler if I've got some another something for you to sew. Until then, I would just say put away anything you know where it goes for a while. Or tidy any area you want. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to stitch right up to that intersection, or almost right up to it. And we are going to take a thread, double it. High marker or silamide or carpet thread works great for this too. And we're going to slide that to the needle. Actually, I can pull one side inside right away, can't I? It seems like extra work, but it's great. So then I'm going to go one stitch past that thread, like that, right? and then move it all to the inside. I'm out of practice with that. Then you don't want to catch it again, so we're just going to move it kind of out of the way. Then we're going to travel up our other side. Oh, you know what I could give you, Katura, to do? Is I'm going to give you the collar to stitch around. Um, so we're going to give Katura back our collar piece. 
Did you see the little thread thing I did in the corner? Have you done that before? Um, you don't have to on the collar, but what you can do here, watch what I've got here. So I stitched up to my corner okay. and then I put a thread around the needle and then tuck the thread in. So when it's time to pull the corner out, we have oh, a, something okay. to pull. Yep. Okay. Yep. So if you want to do this short, this edge, the long edge, and then up to there and okay. leave the whole neck open. The whole neck yep. Open. And then turn it and press it however, however you want to turn and press it. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then give your thread for each corner. You could put a thread here and a thread there, but if you don't want to, you can just work the corner out okay. too. Okay. So what Couture is going to do is we've got our collar that we've got one fashion and one fashion interfaced. We're going to put the interfacing one will be the underside of the collar and the one without interfacing we're going to say will be the top of the collar. But when when she first sews it, it doesn't matter because we can just flip it over. Oh, flip it. And yep. do you want any of it surged? No, don't need to surge any of it. And you can cut half of the seam allowance off. Yep, yep. cool. Okay, so, so she's kind of doing a similar thing on the collar that we're doing on the cuff. And what I'm going to do next on the cuff is get rid of some of my seam allowance. So I am going to cut off a good half of that all the way around. And this kind of, this little trick's like pressing the seam at the lining over first, this little thread in the corner. You can apply these to a whole bunch of things. The, they're great for diamonds on harlequin tutus another thing is like right with interfacing if you get a soft woven interfacing you could say that you're going to interface the audience side or the the side that shows of this then you could use a slightly heavier more starchy starchy interfacing for the side that goes against the body but that's that's totally your call then at the bottom of my cuff i'm going to put just a couple clips because there's a slight curve there. I'm not going to cut pie wedges out though. Okay, so now when we turn this out, that thread that we've got, look, you just pull that and then you have a nice corner and I'm not going to pull that thread out until we iron this. So you kind of start your corner out and you just take that thread that you've got and give it a pull like that. And then we're going to press this. And we've already got one side, one side of seam allowance pressed over. Look, I pulled my corner too hard. I clipped it too close. I yanked my corner too much. So don't pull it as hard as I did because I pulled a fiber of the cuff out. So we just want to get this as nice pressed as we can a lot of times too on a shirt cuff um, you can go back around after the sleeve is put in and just do a quarter inch stitch or an eighth of an inch stitch around everything this corner looks a lot better than the last one look how great that corner looks and that thread is nice because you can you've got something to hold Hey, I'm pretty happy with that, even if I jacked up one corner a little bit. And I lost a little of my press right there. So now, having this one side pressed over already, when we gather our shirt sleeve onto here, it gives us somewhere to fold over and tuck that right down in like that. So let's do that next. And actually, just looking at this now, you can see that my shirt fabric is a bit sheer, so I might be better off with a really thin, thin interfacing on both sides. So because you can kind of see the seam allowance a little bit because the fabric is so sheer. The other thing you could do down there is, is you could pink it if you want to disguise that edge a little bit. Okay, so now I've got my shirt sleeve with my placket here, and the underarm, we stitched the underarm and surged it together and then Katura surged around the cap because we want the cap finished off. But we don't need a surge around the cuff edge of it because it's getting encased in the cuff. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do with a big gathering stitch, I'm just going to peek at this voicemail really quick. Did she leave a voicemail? Sounded 
Ooh, it's a minute long. It's transcribing. So the extra bias that's at the bottom of the, the, the placket here, we can get rid of that now. She's pitching forward. This is. Oh, they're trying to switch. They're trying to switch how our whole mother ginger is put together. They're trying to put the back down the front because she's leaning forward, but she wasn't leaning forward in rehearsals. Um, we'll, I will call them, I'll call them when we're done. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is put a gathering stitch around the bottom. It's just been a mother ginger year, everybody. A last minute, pay us right when it's due, wait to decide if they want it, and then make a mother ginger in a scramble. Not fun. Okay, so I'm putting a gathering stitch in the bottom edge of my sleeve with my shotgun sounding sewing machine. Something is clicking on the inside. Oh, you know what it is? The reverse thing has come unhooked on the inside, which I can deal with later. Look, I bet I just screwed up my gathering stitch while I was messing with that. Starting over, goofed up the gathering stitch. Do, 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 do. If you goof up a gathering stitch, there's no reason to keep going because there just isn't. Okay, so new gathering stitch. And I want to make sure I know which side of my placket is the one that folds back so that I don't like force it open. So there's one gather stitch. You can also make like a loop. You can just like pull a little thread out and turn, turn your seam around and start just keep working the other direction. That click is really annoying, but I know how to fix it later. And it's good this is getting encased in the cup because this is kind of a shredsy family. Okay, so now, now we're going to stick it to the cuff. And they're real faint, but I'm going to put a pin where the notches are in this sucker. And we're going to work right sides together. And I kind of pin the cuff on a little bit and then just gather it to the cuff so that you don't end up gathering it down too small. And we can get rid of those dark threads that we were using to work out the corners. So that edge is going to go all the way to there. Then the next quarter of the cuff goes to the underarm seam. So the intersection of the underarm is our next notch. Then the center of our cuff just goes to the next notch over, which really isn't the center of the sleeve. 
because remember the opening is at the back of the wrist not at the top or underside of the wrist and we've got one more notch so notches are your friend because they help you line everything up nice So now that it's kind of pinned somewhat to the cuff, it's easier to start gathering this down. And hopefully your gathering stitches have not macrameed themselves together into something you can't pull on. And then you're just going to start fitting it in section by section. Oh, this stuff is shredsier than I thought it was. You want to arrange it a little bit as you go so you don't get too much twists going on. And then you just keep arranging and arranging. And once you've got a spot, actually I'm going to scoot a tiny bit of these guys over. Once you've got it somewhat evened out, then you can start adding some pins to it. And instead of pulling all my gathering stitches from one side, I usually think it's easier to deal with one half and then the other half. And on something that's um, really, really um, long, like if you're gathering, you know, yards and yards and yards of stuff, sometimes it's a good idea to like do your gathering stitches in chapters, like gather one half with one set of threads and the other half with another set of threads, because then if you break a gathering thread, um, you don't have to start completely over. You at least got part of it solved. Hey, and this is going to work. So now we just want to even out those remaining gathers. Well, at least a leany mother ginger isn't a, a mother ginger that doesn't work at all. Yeah. But I don't know why they would think to completely turn it around from what it was. And when we were there, it didn't lean forward at all. So I think, I think somebody has taken it upon themselves to make some sort of change. That or the way they've stored it. Well, yeah, I have a feeling it's just been sitting on a floor in the back of a dance studio. Okay, so we're getting there. So remember that part of the cuff that we pressed over earlier? That's going to be on the underside, and we want to keep that out of the way of the sewing. So I'm kind of like feeling underneath that my cuff isn't doing something bizarre. But now I'm going to stitch at a half an inch in. And you kind of arrange the gathers with your fingers a little bit, too, as you go. Some folks, too, I know, like if your seam allowance is a half an inch, they'll put a gathering stitch at like three quarters of an inch and then a quarter of an inch and stitch between the gathers and then pull the, the gathering threads out. So it's really whatever works the best for you is what you should do. But I find for me that I like to kind of have the one stitch right where I'm sewing. And then if some of the gathering thread does show, you can yank it out, seam rip it out later. Okay, so there's a whole hot mess of threads here, which we're going to trim down. You could serge, if you've got a fray fabric, you could serge it first. I generally don't serge stuff that's going to get cut off or trimmed, but if it's driving you nuts, go ahead and serge it. Okay, so now we're going to cut that seam allowance down to about half again because we don't want all that bulk, but we also don't want to cut it so close that it's going to rip out. So, ha ha, check this out. 
right? How not, that's looking pretty good. I'm like satisfied with doing that really quick. Then what's great is we've pre-pressed and pre-stitched that one side of our cuff on the inside. So when we turn this inside out, we don't have to wrestle so much to get this edge of the cuff to lay nice. Does that show? So now we're on the inside of the sleeve. That's the edge we pre pressed and we stitched and pre-pressed over. Then what we do is follow this along that edge, put a few pins in it. And depending on the level of, of you know, depending on the amount of time you've got and the level of impressitude you want to do, you could, the nicest way to finish this is to slip stitch this edge closed along the gathers so that so that it just looks really, really clean and sharp. But what I'm going to do is go on the other side and just go in a smidge from the seam and run a stitch and just stitch through all the layers. So you could slip stitch this and that looks super sharp or you can just put a stitch through everything, which also looks fine. But pre-pressing that one little bit of cuff really makes a nice difference. And we're only going to put one sleeve in this shirt because we've got to get the trunk on it and look at a couple other things. But th this is like the most involved part of this. So now from the right side again, I am going to run a stitch. You could also press this seam allowance a little less than a half an inch so some of it overlaps the seam then you can stitch in the ditch but with what I've done I'm going to stitch like an eighth of an inch towards my cuff and I'm stuck on a pin right there there we go so I'm just going a smidge over from where my seam line is or my ditch is and stitching around stitching across that edge and you want to make sure it all stays tucked in nice I've got a little piece here that doesn't want to stay tucked in nice so I'm going to make it stay tucked in nice yeah the back stitch on this machine is goofed up so then you can pull those pins out. So on the inside, you just have a little stitch running in from the edge. But like I said, you could slip stitch it too. Like if this is, you know, a prize winning shirt that you're making. So now let me stick my arm in there. And it's starting to happen. So look how nice that cuff is. And we have our a 3 8 inch overlap to put a hook and bar or whatever we want to. And then you can you can start to see what we're talking about with like the blousiness. If I run my arm down, um, you see how we get blousiness rather than it being all tied up like this, that the cuff pushing the sleeve up is what's creating the blousiness out the bottom. So if you wanted more of this, you just split your sleeve and add length to your sleeve. But what I'm going to do now is put my gathering stitches in the cap of the sleeve. So between my balance points. So I've got to go from one balance point to the other. So that's the back of my arm. Oh, now we're out of bobbin. It's bound to happen. Let me wind a bobbin. Does anybody have a question about what I did with the cuff it, real quick? Because Jared is at a spot where he can run and look at the computer and read me a question. While I wind my bobbin. While I wind my shallow industrial bobbin. So once we get the shoulders gathered, we're going to put the front of the shirt on. 
and then we'll deal with the collar and the facing and the trunk. And we will, um, right, I owe so many people patterns from classes. Once the Christmas season winds down, oh, uh, can you can you get the door? Just just meet him in the hallway and sign for whatever it is. Everybody, be quiet. Sorry about that. Basil Taylor Everett. Let me let me turn my mic off and yell at the dogs. It's still on. Oh well, that's me yelling at the dogs. I like how none of the delivery people get the note on the door that says, please do not knock, just come in. It's, ooh, it's from Milk Bar in New York. I ordered a cake for Christmas. Um, yeah, the delivery people don't read the sign on the door. It said, the first thing it says, hi, don't knock. That's all right, maybe they're scared of dogs. I mean, it does sound like there's a hun like 100 dogs in here. Thanks for getting that. You just say, yeah. Okay, here's that loop I was talking about. Another way to gather is when you get to one end, take the top thread and pull out a loop and sink your needle. But then it's kind of weird because you got the bulk on the wrong side of the sewing machine. But that's another way to do a gathering stitch. And they get, it gets less knotted up. So I put a gather right at my seam allowance, and then now I'm like halfway between my seam allowance and the edge. Well, the dog outburst didn't last too long. Now the cap of this, remember we put more fullness at the wrist than we did at the cap. So I'm gonna only gather it down a little bit and I'm gonna put a pin at my shoulder because I don't want it to disappear into my gathering stitches. So we've got less cap than we do wrist, less volume at the cap. So I'm gonna just kind of pre-gather it an itty bitty bit, but then I'm gonna adjust it once it goes in into my shirt. Another thing that you can do is like, you can put the shoulders of your shirt together and not the side seams, then you can put the, um, sleeve to it, but then just remember that you'd only stitch the underarm part way down uh, and then deal with the cup. Well, actually you could do, yeah, you'd, you'd put the put the shoulder of your shirt together, then gather your sleeve into it, then close part of your underarm and get your cuff on, then later on you'd close the side of your shirt and the underarm of your sleeve. Um, but so we've got our sleeve looking really good and ready to go. Let me grab the body of our shirt and let me grab a front. Let's see if I know what the fronts look like. That's a sleeve. That's, there's the fronts. So we need the fronts next. We need the fronts next. Okay, so let's look at this yoke business, what's going on right now. So what we did is we put one side of the yoke, we gathered it on, so we gathered one side of the yoke to it, then we put the other yoke behind it and stitched it up. So we've got two, the two yokes, so we've got two yokes, and they're entrapping the seam allowance in between them. So no matter whether we look on the inside or the outside of the shirt, we don't have a seam allowance there. And what, what you can do is you can come in and you can cut out half of that seam allowance. So we're trimming away half of the seam allowance between our yoke and the back of our shirt. Bum, bum, bum. Then you can run a top stitch um, through all those layers if you would like. Hey, well, the dogs calm down pretty quick after the door knocking. There's a place in New York that makes cakes and ice creams by taking milk and soaking children's classic cereal in the milk, and then they use the cereal milk to make 
cake and ice cream from. What? Yeah, so I ordered one because they had free shipping. It's going for Christmas. But there's truffles in there we can eat after class. So now, same thing. You want to kind of be aware of what's going on underneath and on the top. Some, some shirts you'll look at, like costume shirts or boughten shirts, they'll just fold one side of the yoke down and stitch the seam allowance to the lining side of the yoke. Um, so whichever you want to do is totally fine. But I'm stitching this side down. And you can make a shirt without a yoke too. You could just make a back that runs the whole way down. Or just add a pleat way up at the neck so there's a little volume going down this shirt. But it doesn't have to run the whole way down. So we've got that entrapped nice now. And then you could give that a press. And then now we're going to put our um, fronts on. And we're going to catch the fronts between the two shoulders of the yoke also. So there won't be an exposed shoulder seam. But another way to do it would be just serge this together and put the fronts on. Um, but we're just showing more some more stuff. So what I'm going to do is put my two fronts to my shoulders of what we're calling the outside, right? This is our lining, the, the rougher side. So we're going to put shoulders to the shoulder of one of the yokes because we're going to encase this seam allowance. Yeah? Oh, you're all right? I almost dropped it. Jared's got a lot of sand in the to today. He had to run to Micro Center. I would have ran to Micro Center, but I was working with Irma to rescue this trunk pattern for the world. Then I've got a little bit of ease in my back yoke. Remember, we left a little extra room in that shoulder. So all I'm kind of doing is like dividing it. I'm kind of evening out that ease and dividing it between my pins. If I get a pucker this time, I apologize. Hey, that's all right. That's good. That's good. It's good for show and telling. Thank you. That, no, no, no. <laughs> now I'm going to do the other shoulder. So we're nearly, we're nearly to putting in a sleeve and putting on the collar. And then we'll put on a trunk. So the trunk pattern goes up to the waist, right? But remember, we made the shirt three inches longer. So we're going to start by whacking off about three inches or a little bit less. Because remember, the trunk is stretchy. So three inches on the pattern doesn't necessarily mean three inches in the real world. So we might just cut off about two and a half inches of the trunk. Um, I'm thinking if that mother ginger was a super issue, they would have just called right back, right? They would have like constantly been calling. So now I'm going to put those seams together. And I need not a gathering stitch. So there's one shoulder. And then you can just butt the next shoulder right up to it and then trim your threads. So now we're going to entrap, we're going to encase this seam. So let's look at how we do that. So we've got, we've got a set of yoke, one, one yoke hooked to the front, and then we've got this other yoke that's hanging out down here. And what we want to do is get all of these seams to the inside. So you could just fold it over and top stitch it because that looks nice. But what I'm going to do is figure out which way my seams need to go. They need to go all towards the inside, and I am going to pull it through itself. So see, I've got one hand in the yoke, 
and I've got I know my seams need to come together this direction so I'm gonna just twist it so I'm making so I'm kind of like I'm pulled part of the shirt inside the yoke and then we're just gonna restitch that edge I might have lost you on us on that step but when I turn it back right side out you'll be like oh yeah I totally get it and since my back is kind of eased on now I think I can get away with less pins so now we're just restitching on the line that we've already stitched back stitch then while you're in here you can trim this down half you could surge it if you're if you're worried about it getting washed a ton and want to make sure nothing happens but generally you know like a bottom thing that's encased isn't surged and it gets washed a lot so that's that's what I meant about entrap that seam so now our shoulder seam allowance is all on the inside of the yoke. So let's do that now with the other side. So the easiest way for me to figure it out is to just hold the seams together that need to be sewn together and then flip it around. There might be a better name for what I'm doing here, but I don't know what it is. And you know what I'm thinking, guys, since this class, right, this was one that we kind of canceled and then added two spots, I think I'm going to just keep working on this shirt so that we get, everybody gets the recordings for this one. Then in the next class, I'll start with the more basic shirt shape and still send everybody those recordings rather than, rather than just trying to rush sewing the rest of this up we'll see how far i get but i think that's what i'm going to do so anybody that's in this class i will still send you the recordings when we do it in january because it's going to be a little bit different it'll be very similar but i think it'll be it'll be a little bit different and then the people that are doing it in january i'll send this set of recordings So I'm going to trim that down. Another thing you could do if you're like worried about longevity or fraying or something is when you've got this inside out like that, a lot of stuff, right? Sergers haven't really been around that long. A lot of times people will just use a zigzag and overcast over a seam. And that works really well too. And if you're sitting at the sewing machine, then you don't have to run over or swivel your chair or whatever to get to your serger and that will keep that edge in there really 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 nice so we've got our back and our front now and actually um miss katura i'm going to give you this to just surge so let's look i just want you to surge some of this separate you're going to surge the side nice. seam the armhole in the side Got it. and then do the same, same thing on the other, other side. side. Yep. Got yep. Okay. So Couture is going to surge our side seams and our armhole and then we're going to sew it together separate. Well, I've got so many shreddy pieces of, of, of thread on me. Then let's look at our collar. Looking good, looking good. I'm going to trim out just a little bit more in the corner. So our collar's got one side interfaced. And one side not interfaced. Work. Oh, a, man, a sequin just appeared. That happens here a lot. And before we put this on the shirt, we're going to wrap it on the dress form so you can kind of see how this roll is going to work. And then I am going to put a couple little... So this, this is what I call an outside curve. An outside curve is where you would cut some pie slices. 
an inside curve, you only need to just put little, little straight clips. You don't need tons because it's not a super sharp curve. The sharper the curve, the more, the more little pie wedges you would clip out. Actually, there's a, um, if you draw, it's like some people get stuck on where to do what. I always say to think of it like a whale, right? Here's the tail of a whale, and then his back goes like this, and then his head goes like that, right? There's my beautiful whale drawing. Um, here would be where you would just clip um, pie wedges, right? Because when they fold over, when this seam allowance folds over, they're getting closer together. Your pie wedges end up closing up on each other. So on the back of the whale or the head of the whale, you clip pie wedges. But on the tail of the whale, you only need to just clip straight into it. Because when you clip straight into this kind of a curve, they lay to the inside and they actually open up. So you wouldn't cut a pie wedge on an inside curve, you would just cut a pie wedge on an outside curve. He's pretty happy, dude. Look at that. And here comes Jonah. No, who 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 went who who sailed into the whale in the Bible? Jonah? Jonah! Jonah in the whale. There's Jonah going into the whale. A good Christmas story. So now let's press our collar. And then I'm going to just baste the neck edge of the collar together so we don't have our different layers. Um, shifting around. Oh, I poked the I poked the corner too hard. I'm always using scissors that are way too sharp and stabbing through the corner. But this corner you could also do with that little string trick that we showed you. So let me give this a little press. Do, 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 do. Yep, and and having played with this fabric now for a little bit. Um, if you had a woven, a really thin woven interfacing, a real fine one, you could just interface both sides lightly. Because it's a little sheer. And also another thing is like you can trim the seam allowance. Like if you use a really small stitch, you can trim the seam allowance down a considerable amount. Like if you've got if you've got seams that are showing that you don't like, make them smaller, but you need to use a smaller, a smaller stitch. So now I'm gonna put a few pins in the neck edge and baste it together before it goes on to the shirt because we don't want it to slide around. And I could spend a little more time getting that pressed really nice, but this is just so we can see all the steps. So I'm going to baste that. Now, if you oh, whoop, if you weren't putting a facing in the shirt, you know, right? We're putting a facing around the whole neck to finish stuff off. You wouldn't stitch the collar together. You would stitch one side of the collar to one layer of the collar to the shirt then flip over the seam allowance of the other part of the collar and stitch that to the shirt. Or you could even treat the collar similarly to what we did with the cuff, where we pressed one side over and then dealt with one side and then dealt with the other side. So let me clip my threads, and I'll take my coat off of the dress form. So you guys, so remember how we shrunk the outside edge of our collar pattern? to make it roll that'll be more that'll be more noticeable here in two seconds oh i thought he lost a wheel so now when we put this on you'll see that it makes its very own roll line and I'll put some pins in it too. So I'll, 
something right here. So see, oh, it's too bright. We're in a bright spot. Maybe I should go. Nope, that's a bright spot. Oh, maybe that's the spot. Um, so you'll see what's happening is that the collar is standing up on the neck. It's not way down on the neck. So when we shrink this outside edge, the more we shrink it, the more the collar stands up. And actually, oh, fabulous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If I take and put a couple pins in this, you can see where the roll line actually has ended up. Um, I think that's it for now. Oh, yeah, but check this. Isn't that fine? Did you know yeah, if you, gonna, if you shrink the outside edge, that's what makes it stand up. So the more you shrink this, the higher it stands up. Yeah, but what, what, what? I got to, I, I lost my spot. Let me get her pin back on there. Actually, our roll line is even a little bit higher. So we don't, so the collar isn't standing up much, but it's standing up a little bit and looks nice. Um, let me message this uh, teaching one more hour. Saw message. Do, 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 do. So, so if you look, let me straighten out my pins. You can see that we've now, we've got like a finger full or about three quarters inch, an, an inch of the collar. We've got about this much collar standing up on his neck. So here's our seam allowance. We've got the collar standing up on his neck. So the more you the more you take away from the outside edge of your pattern the higher it will stay on the guy's neck so let me put my side seams together i'm going to pin them up here on the table um the guy is coming at one um i know what do. Sorry, got to got to put out fires in California. It's a different kind of fire. Done at three my time. Okay, so let's pin our side seams together. We've nearly got a shirt. We've nearly got a shirt. So what I was saying earlier when I was at the sewing machine, right? You can take your sleeve depending on how you like um, to sew stuff, you can take your sleeve cap and gather it into the armhole before, before you do up your side seam. So you can gather the cap into the arm, then in one stitch you would do your underarm of the sleeve and the underarm of your shirt all at once. But if that's the order you're doing it, don't put the cuff on first, put the cuff on later. Otherwise you're gonna have a problem with the underarm seam and stuff. Um, so let's put our side seams together. And again, we just did half inches on this because it is not, um, it is not that fitted. So I don't feel like we need to let it out. Actually, you know what I'm gonna do, Katura? I'm going to get the side seams pinned. So I'm going to pin the side seams, and we're going to have you stitch them and press them open. And then we're going to look at the sleeve. We're going to figure out which side the sleeve goes on and give you a sleeve to put in. So we're going to get, we're going to have Katura do our side seams and our sleeve cap. And don't worry about getting the cap like, eased or gathered in perfect you're just going to get it you're just going to get it in yeah and then you could surge around the bottom yeah 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 i didn't think this stuff would be that frayy but it's freighting that's why it was on sale somebody used it and said this stuff is awful then that'll give me a chance to start cutting out the trunk which is important. We've got to get through the trunk. So 
So there's your side seams. And this is the left arm. So the shirt opens in the front. This is the left arm. And you're just going to put the underarm seam in. And then it's flat from where the gathers start. And then there's your shoulder. And then just kind of ease that in between. Yeah, okay. yeah. So we're going to give Couture the sleeve cap and the side seams to put in. Then after that's on, we're going to baste the collar onto the neck. And then remember the facing that I said we made a lasso facing. You can kind of see why it's called a lasso facing because it kind of, anyway, it's an old term, but I, I still use it. So we'll put the collar on to the shirt. Then we'll lay the facing onto it, stitch all the way around, up the front, around the collar and back, and the facing will flip to the inside, and it will finish all that edge off, and it being interfaced gives us somewhere for buttons or buttonholes or closures at the front of the shirt. Let's make a trunk. Let's have a sip of water. Ah, that's good. Okay, so everyone will be getting this trunk pattern. Um, it's just going to take me a smidge longer to size it up. Oh, it's sized. It's going to take me a smidge longer to relay them all out on a file. But it's it'll come with like six sizes, two kind of large, two kind of medium, and two kind of small. And then there's an info page that isn't lost about how to like, shrink the girth or take a little bit out of the waist. And what I was saying earlier is this doesn't fit super duper tight. It just kind of like fits. So if you make one of these sizes up and put it on a guy and you're like, it's a little loose, just take a little bit vertically out of the whole thing and that'll tighten the whole, that'll tighten the whole trunk up. Are you cold? I'm like, Jared's like freezing. Uh-oh. Jared, better not get sick. Christmas is coming. Um, would you grab me some like uh, quarter inch elastic or three eighths inch elastic? Yeah. Um, so the other thing that that this trunk comes with. So if you're not using it on a shirt and you just want to use it for a boy's trunk, it has kind of an elastic guide. So the distance of this line, right? There's a line at the top. It says the distance of this line times two is your waist elastic. So if you're putting a waist elastic on there, there's a guideline for that. And then below each of the patterns, there's a guideline for if you're doing the full trunk or there's a guideline if you're doing the thong trunk. And actually it suggests on here if you're doing the full trunk where the, where the elastic is around the thigh, that's great, where the elastic is around the thigh to use... Um, three-eighths or half-inch elastic, but if you're doing the thong one, it says use quarter-inch or three-eighths because you don't want such great big elastic at the thong. And also, that being said, sometimes you'll make a shirt and a trunk with a built-in trunk and not put um, and not put any elastic in the bottom, so that also works. So we're going we're gonna to do quarter-inch elastic in the legs. And I'm going to cut the thong style one. So I'm going to just say, this is my elastic. So there's a little elastic guide on there. I'm going to just put it. That becomes the elastic for one leg. So see how the guide makes it short on purpose? And then you have to stretch it. Um, so let's, we're just going to elastic one leg. But you can also not put any elastic in it. And if I was going to do this one without any elastic in the legs, I would take a little bit vertically out of the trunk. Um, but let's cut out this thong style one. And then when you're doing a ballet shirt, you have to remember where, how do they get in the shirt? The front of the shirt is opening and closing. So this pattern starts out with the front on the fold. So you might not want to cut the front on the fold um, because a little bit of this has to be open for them to step into it. But but also, um, the, the trunk itself is on a stretch fabric. So whether there, if there's no shirt on this pattern, it will still pull up their body. And actually, if 
if this were the front of our shirt, as long as there's not closures, as long as the front of the shirt isn't sewn closed, they should be able to step into it. Um, but know that if they're having trouble stepping into it and pulling it on, you might put a little bit of a split in the front of the trunk just so it opens up a little bit more. Um, the other thing that happens sometimes depending on how, so it's really about how your shirt's closing. Sometimes you end up with that scenario where there's a little hook and bar in the back of their crotch. So they put the shirt on like an old style leotard and then they've got a snap or a hook in the crotch. So you will, you will not have the same situation every time. So I know that like nobody likes to hear stuff like that. Everybody likes like definite, this is the only way to do it. But depending on the style of your shirt, you're not gonna have that, that happen every time. So my piece of mesh is cut pretty darn crooked, so I'm gonna just line it up. I'm looking at my salvage edge in my table to get it kind of straight. And then I'm gonna see if I've got enough goods to cut my front on the fold. So um, so the, the other thing to think about is like, does the bottom of your shirt, when the shirt isn't closed, does the hem of your shirt fit over their hips? And with everything we've added for this one, it does. But if your shirt is more fitted at the waist or more fitted at the hem, you might end up having to do um, the snap style crotch. Ooh, and guess what I didn't remember to do. Remember, we were making our shirt go three inches past the waist. So I don't want to cut my trunk all the way up to the waist. But I don't want to totally cut three inches off either because this is stretchy fabric. I'm going to cut off just about two and a half. And I'm just saying that I've got a quarter inch seam allowance already in there. So I'm not worried about adding seam allowance to my trunk. So this top part of the trunk that I'm zipping off right now is nearly the amount that the shirt goes below the waist. So if the trunk pattern you're using, you can, we also have a booty short pattern that works really well. Um, so if your shirt isn't going all the way to the waist, you don't need a thing that goes all the way to the waist. So now I'm gonna cut this trunk off. You know what, I am gonna put just a smidge of seam allowance at the top. But the rest of this has seam allowance. And when you get your trunk, there's like a little note on the pattern that says first connect your inseam. So that's like there's a spot marked A uh, on the thong, and then for the for the big for the fuller trunk that goes further down the leg, there's a spot marked A to B. So that's your inseam. So just look at that little note first. And since this is uh, got like this is more specifically a guy's trunk than just our booty short pattern, you'll see there's a little if I hold it up, there's a little. Right, A is our inseam. So the first thing we're gonna do, and we could surge this, but I'm gonna just do it with the machine. The first thing we would do is connect A to B. Then there's a little dart that gives him just a little bit of room for his male anatomy. Then you put that in, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is connect. So right, it's looking like a thong now. I'm gonna connect my two little inseams, my A to B, my A to B, and then this is my back, this this is my back crotch, then you sew the back crotch all the way up to the dart in the front. So let's, we're gonna go back to the sewing machine, Mr. Jared, and I am going to put my thong together, and I am going to grab my piece of elastic. Um, I'm just gonna elastic up one leg for today. Got my leg elastic, and remember there's a guide. There's a guide that's gonna come below the pattern. This doesn't really show, but there's lines here that says, for this, cut this long of elastic. So I'm gonna, so you could surge this, but I'm gonna just zigzag it together because I've got a sewing machine right here. So the first thing we're gonna do, 
So this is our front, this is our back, and this little spot, the bottom, the bottommost part of that, that's your inseam. So the first thing I'm going to do, right, it's a thong, so it doesn't really have much inseam. You can also, just on that pattern, find a spot between the thong and the full brief and cut like a more modest version, more, you know, more, um, just a little less revealing than the thong. But a, a, a lot of shirts for shows will have more of a thong style control element to it because you don't want so much to show um, underneath their tights. Some shirts even will just have two pieces of elastic that get folded or, you know, that just hook from like the side fronts to the side back of the shirt and just get jammed underneath the poor guy's crunch. So again, you could surge this little spot, but I'm just skipping that and zigzagging it for now. So now that we've got the inseams together, let's open this back up. So now we're going to put the back crotch together and that follows all the way around into this little dart that gives him a little bit of room for his stuff. For his, what, what I used to say, special purpose. That's where his special purpose goes. So then you want to line up the inseams nice. And actually, what I'll do sometimes, you know, right, we've got these seams going right in his crotch. I'll push one one direction. And if so if this were surged, I would push one one way and the other the other way so that you don't have all of the thickness laying on top of each other. You have the thickness kind of separated. And then now, now we're to that little dart that's at the front. So when I flip this around now, it'll start to look more like a thong or a dance belt. So you can see now that the front, the front has got this little, there's a little bump out in the front to make a little bit of room for stuff. And then there's the back. So it's kind of just, it's kind of just a thong. Um, and then I have, I have at times, depending on who the wearer is, because different guys have a different comfort level, I have at times actually gotten rid of quite a bit of this, this space on either side of the center back seam and narrowed this up more like a dance belt. But you've just kind of got to, have a sense for like who your dude is and what he'll be okay with um because it really is like if you look at a dance belt the back of a dance belt doesn't have very much to it so now i'm just connecting my elastic into a loop and i'm going to just kind of pin my elastic and quarters around this whole thing now on something like this i don't uh, you know, like on a leotard, you'll put the elastic on and then fold it over again. On something like this, you don't necessarily have to do the second fold. You can just zigzag the elastic on because that second fold might be creating more of a bump on the outside of the costume. And we're trying to avoid lumps and bumps in their tights, which is also the other reason why you might just take the pattern and fold out some some circumference around their body and just make a mesh trunk that has no elastic in it at all. So there's there's definitely options here. So now I'm going to put another pin in the middle. I'm kind of dividing it roughly into quarters. If I can grab that. And we're just going to zigzag that around. And I'm going to stretch it a little bit while I zigzag it to make sure no stitches pop. Kind of quarters. 
You could even use eighth inch elastic in here and really stretch it because the eighth inch elastic isn't very sturdy at all. So I'm just going to work my way around that opening. <gasps> I lost my pin. It was about right there. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Don't drive drunk like I'm doing here. If, you, if you've got mesh too for your trunk instead of Lycra, you'd be more likely to get away with doing the second fold in this elastic. But if you've got Lycra, you probably don't want to do the second fold. So let's stick this little itsy bitsy thing on the dress form for just a second. Now, our dress form doesn't have a butt or a crotch. So this will be, well, careful, careful. This will be a little bit loose. But we should be able to see what's going on. So there, look how great that is. Um, there's, does that show? Yeah, that shows enough. So this is the side that's got elastic in it. And that, that little bit of seam allowance there, if you want, you can trim some of that away. Because like, if you look at a guy's dance belt, the part that's right underneath is really, usually it's just a piece of elastic that's only about that wide. But, um, but you 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 decide on your dude whether he can handle that or not. And then the front here, there's there's room for his um, special purpose in there when he's got his dance belt on. So right now it just looks like a, a sad little wrinkle. But this guy doesn't have a special purpose. Um, he just is totally flat. So and then having this longer than the shirt, that's what gives our shirt somewhere to go. And um, you've got your side seams. Woohoo! And the sleeve. Wow, Katura is fast. We're just gonna hang out for two seconds while she presses her side seams. Look, I put a different shirt on today too. Anybody who's been doing some of the last webinars is like, God, Travis never changes his clothes. But I just keep washing the same sweatshirt because it makes me feel good. It's just been the nutcracker every time. Like you turn, it's like. He's just smiling. Oh, yeah, I've been wearing a Nutcracker sweater, too. I have, like, a Norwegian sweatshirt, a Nutcracker sweater, and a dirty old navy sweater. Like, those are my holiday go-to things. Yay, yay, yay. Don't even worry about the sleeve cap. No, we're good. We're good. Thank you, thank you, thank right you. Right right yeah. Right right yeah. Oh, okay. That's the left sleeve. <laughs> yes, perfect. So... Bless you, Jared. Thank you. So we're getting all kinds of shirt stuff now. Let's have another looky-loo before we do our last little bits of sewing. So um, also, the, the other problem with these dress forms is this guy's rise is absolutely ridiculous. So the, on this gentleman, shh, you guys have been doing so good. Taylor. I love the dogs. There's going to always be dogs here. Um, the, what's goofy about this guy is, right, we cut this two and a half inches lower than the waist, but this trunk is actually way the heck down here. Like, atomically, this dress form is like a good two or three inches too long from his waist to his butt. So when we put this shirt on here, it's going to seem like it's getting pulled down too much. But if we put it on a human, it's not. Um, but look how nice our back is looking. So this is going to get hooked to the trunk. You can see just by the way that this cuff is hanging. See, remember how we lengthened the back of the sleeve and shortened the front? Just by the way this sleeve is hanging without a human in it, that's what's happening which is what we want, because that looks really, really, really nice. Then 
Um, actually, the next thing we're going to do is put our collar and our facing on. So this shirt that we can kind of do a check, right? If we want this to meet on the trunk, we have to make sure that the shirt itself, that the hem of the shirt is bigger than his hips. Because for, for this shirt, if we're not putting some weird split in the front of the trunk, he's got to be able to step, oh, my pants are falling down. He's got to be able to step into the shirt and pull the bottom of the shirt past his butt. So we definitely have enough room in our shirt that he can pull it past his butt. Now, if the bottom of your shirt was more fitted and he can't pull it past his butt, then you have to put a split in, you put a little split in the mesh. So you could you could cut this with a seam and just fold your seam allowances back to have a little something to put a hook and bar. Or you could just split it and fold over like a quarter inch on each side and zigzag it. But you would need that little split so that he can pull the shirt on. So So that's kind of like just something to remember, like can he get into it? Um, let me grab our collar, and I'm going to just pin the collar on while we're here. And then remember on our pattern, so right now we have a half inch seam allowance, but then we have a half inch um, of over and under lap. So the collar doesn't go all the way to the edge of the seam allowance. It goes just to the beginning of our over and under lap. If I put it back over here, does it show better? Um, I'm just pinning the collar on where it's marked on the pattern, essentially. Sorry that the, the lighting, we never quite have the right lighting. Either we have not enough or too much. So I'm gonna just kind of pin my collar on and then we're gonna base the collar on and then we're gonna put the facing on. And our collar pattern also had the shoulders marked so we can line up the shoulders. And our little bit of roll will come back as soon as we stitch this on. So I'm going, I've got the fronts pinned. I'm gonna just pin the rest of it in my lap. And then I'm gonna lay our, our facing right to it. So the part of our facing that's on the outside you know, the outer edge of the facing we surged. But the but this part of the facing that's getting sewn to the shirt, there's no reason to surge because it's gonna get it's gonna all get encased. So I'm just finishing pinning my collar to my shirt body. And you could you can probably imagine right, the collar is interfaced and basted together and your neck edge right now is just a big curve cut over the bias. So if it seems like your neck edge has grown a little bit, just ease it back onto the collar. It will grow because it's a cut on a curve. So you just wanna fit all that back onto there. And then we're gonna stitch that with a half an inch seam, my neck has grown a little bit too. Me putting it on the dress form and yanking it around, it wasn't helping. So I'm gonna stitch the collar on so that it doesn't move when we put the facing on. So I need a straight stitch again. And I'm gonna go from my collar side because since the shirt has grown a little bit, it makes more sense to put that side against the feed dogs. And then like closures, you can do little bitty snaps, you can do actual buttons and buttonholes if you've got a good buttonhole system on your sewing machine. Um, sometimes there'll be snaps with a hook, a little itty bitty hook between the snaps so that he never totally comes undone. 
it's up to you. So now that that's basted on, now we're going to pin our facing on. So our facing is going to go up the front, around the neck, and back down the other side of the front all at once. So my collar, my collar is just loosely on. It's basted on. So now I'm going to put the right side of my facing to this business here. And we're going to stitch all the way around that. And then on our facing, we'll trim away some of the seam allowance and press it over nice. You could also understitch the front, the front seam allowances towards the facing. We'll see. I think we'll just get this shirt completely done in time. Minus closures. I'm not doing closures. Everybody has to find their own closure. Get it? It's a joke. So there's one side of the facing. Then I'm going to pin the other big, long, straight side because that's easiest. Isn't sewing fun? I like it. I'm still always fascinated that you can just start with a rectangle of paper and a rectangle of fabric and then make something that you can wear. But do I make my own clothes? Heck no. That sounds like torture. I've got just a little bit of finagle in here. I've got a little bit of a bubble, so I'm just figuring out if it's how I have something lined up or if it's how something is cut. And I think it was actually how I have it pinned. I think I've nearly gotten rid of my bubble. You don't want a bubble to turn into a pucker. Okay, so now we've got the fronts pinned. Now we're going to match our center back up of our facing to the center back of everything else that we've got going on. Couple more pins. Oh, Basil's getting some snuggles over there. Good for you, Basil. Uh-oh, I'm almost out of pins. And I've got some random ones hanging around the sewing machine. Oh, right, can Basil get me some pins? He's He used to be helpful, but now he's just crabby. Okay, so now we're going to stitch that whole thing. And then I'm going to just trim part of it away, but you guys will know to trim more seam allowance because I want to show you how to understitch the fronts. You could uh, understitch around the whole thing if you wanted, but I just want to show you the concept and how to do it. So we're connecting our facing around the whole neck. And trapping the collar between the facing and the shirt. Turn in the corner of our over and under lap. Then you've kind of like, right, you've got interface stuff, you've got bias stuff, you've got stuff that's already been basted. You just kind of have to like address each section of this as you sew it. 
to see if the right things are happening and that you haven't done something weird on the underside also. It's a bit to arrange, but if you can avoid weird things as you're sewing it, that's a good thing. Okay, let's pull these pins out. So we've got our face and going around the neck. Oh, my seam allowance at the center back got folded funny. I would go back and just fix that little spot so the seam allowance lays open. You can also do this type of facing where you actually have a shoulder seam. If you think you're going to be taking up or letting down the shoulders of this, you would want a shoulder seam in the facing, and then you would leave the shoulder seam exposed in the shirt. I'm just going to trim one side of this down. So I'm trimming through the collar and everything. And if you're a grader, if you like to like have your seam allowances staggered, like one a little thinner than the next, you can absolutely do that here. And then at my curve, at my outside curve, where my over and under lap is, I need a couple little pie slices. And then I just am going to kind of see if I need to trim out a lot at the neck. Oh, I have a pucker. I said don't make puckers, but I have a pucker. Darn it. So where my pucker is, for now I'm going to just clip it and let it lay open. But you'll know that if you get a pucker, you've got to clip it and fix it. It's because I wasn't paying enough attention to what was going on underneath. You hardly get a pucker on the side of the stuff that you can see. You're going to get a pucker on the side that you can't see. So on my neck edge, I'm going to put just a few clips. Then let's look here. So, right, so we're on the inside of the shirt now. This is my facing over here on the left side. Then that's going to get folded to the inside, and then it finishes off the center front of the shirt. I'm going to understitch part of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push all of my seam allowances towards the facing. So I've got my seam allowance here. This is my facing on the left, or where my hand is with the rings. My shirt's on the right side, I'm pushing all the seam allowance towards the facing and I'm going to stitch about an eighth of an inch in to hold all of that down. Then you can trim out some there too. And once we've got this on the form, we'll kind of zoom in on this under stitch here. So I can't understitch around the tight little curve where my over and under lap is, but I can get kind of close. Then if you wanted to understitch the back of the collar, you could also understitch the back of the collar. And what the understitch does is it just kind of helps stuff roll the right direction. So then you could come back and trim out part of this, the, the seam allowance next to your understitch. But what I'm going to do now is press my fronts and stick this sucker onto the trunk. And then we'll pull her up on the dress form, and that will be where we call it a day. So then in the next shirt class, what I'm going to do is send those guys this recording. But then we're going to start with the more basic shaped shirt, and then I will send you guys that recording when we're done with it with that one. So you can just keep trimming away that seam allowance, but let's give this a press. So we need to work out our over and under lapped part on both sides. And then um, 
then we'll stick it on the trunk. So if you're skipping the facing and hooking the collar right to the neck, you've got to decide how it is you're going to reinforce your, your buttons or your closures down the front. You can cut a rectangle and interface it and apply it on, um, apply, apply it right onto the front. Like look at a man's dress shirt too. Sometimes there's like creative folds of fabric and rectangles and stuff stuck into there. So I'm just, oh, I've, I've left where Jared is. I'm just pressing. All I'm doing is pressing my facing over. So I'm pressing my facing towards the inside and I'm getting my, my center front is lined up as nice as I can. There's our over and under lamp. And I'm gonna press my facing on the other side. And this is the side we understitched. So that the side that we understitched so see what I've done is I've pushed the seam allowance towards the facing and then I stitched it like an eighth of an inch from the edge. You could trim this out better. But what that does is that forces the front of the shirt to roll a little bit towards the inside and it makes it press up much nicer. You get a much nicer edge there. Then just work out your, your over and under lamp. We're gonna eat a truffle in a few minutes from Milk Bar, you guys. Hopefully they're gluten-free. We'll Google. Just go for it. So then, right, I undid that spot where I had a pucker. This, this is tricky to press without a ham, so I'm gonna just give it a little bit of steam. Just kind of warm it up. Then on the dress form, you could give it some more steam. Or if you have a press ham, you could press it with a ham. But um, we're gonna put the trunk on the bottom now and then look at it. We're gonna look at a few tacks you can do uh, to the facing to hold all the facing in there. So let me grab the trunk and we're gonna get this pinned onto the trunk. So on your shirt, right, we said this, we're, we're just saying that this slides over the guy's hips. What you need to do before you put it on the trunk probably is put your closures on. But what I'm going to do, since we're not putting closures on it, is I know that my center front is about a half an inch on each side of the outer edge. So I need to pin my center fronts together. So I'm actually going to pin my shirt together left over right like it will be when it's all done. And then I want to pin, you could baste your facing back so it doesn't make weird folds and stuff. I'm going to just put a pin in my facing. Whoop, not that one. To hold my facings back. Then I'm going to just find the center front of my trunk. So straight, the center back has a seam in it. That's easy. And my center front is straight above the dart and I might also be good to find the side seams of my trunk because our shirt has side seams so we're just gonna say that the sides of the shirt are gonna line up to the sides of the trunk now my hope is that there's not so much fullness in the shirt that I can't stretch the trunk to match it um, so we're, we're gonna find out right now so I'm going to put my trunk right side down to the center front of my shirt. So we're going to have to like twist the shirt a little bit inside of the trunk. So there's my side seam. So I'm going to just see, can I stretch the trunk to my side seam. I think I can do it. I'm gonna just stretch it as I sew and match up my pins, but you could pin the thing the whole way around. This might go on a little wonky, but you'll get the idea. So I've got my center fronts of everything lined up. And I'm just saying that I've got like a quarter inch-ish seam allowance. That zigzag is way too wide. So, I know where the side seam of my shirt is and the side seam of my trunk are. 
I'm going to just stretch the trunk as I go so that I can try to match the side seam. And the back of our shirt is considerably fuller, so hopefully I can stretch this trunk enough to meet the back of the shirt. If I can't, I would have to put a, a little bit of, sorry about that, I'd have to put a little bit of a gather into the back of the shirt so that it fits. I'm sewing a little bit drunk, but that's all right. Don't sew your trunk drunk. So now I've got the center back of my trunk, but let me find the actual center back of my shirt and put a pin in it. So now I've got to stretch the back of the trunk even a little bit more. And this, is, this isn't the thinnest weight stretch mesh either. It's kind of like the in-between one. It's not super heavy, but it's not super thin. If you had the really thin one, that stuff's really easy to stretch. Um, so that's, a good, that's good to know too. The thinner mesh stretches a little bit more. So we've made it to the center back. We are halfway there. And if you think, you know, if you've, if you, this is going to be a shirt that goes into your rep and gets used every single year, um, you could surge this part on too. Like the more, the more, if a seam isn't encased, it's great to surge it. So we've made it to our side, our other side. And now we've got to stretch the last of this around to our front, but that means I need to shove the whole shirt into the trunk so I can get to that seam. Do, 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 do. It's kind of like putting a, a sleeve cap in. So I'm like negotiating the facing too to make sure there's not something weird getting folded in the facing. So you could base the facing back, you know, base the facing where it belongs before you go to put the trunk on. But let's put this puppy on the dress form. So remember the crotch of our dress form is a little bit unhumanly long, but um, we'll look at the last couple things. Actually, we're going to put it on inside out first. I'm going to put this on inside out because I want to show you a couple other finishes that you'll want to do. Just a few little touch-up steps. So we're inside out right now for just a minute because we're going to look at the facing. Right? <sighs> this guy, it's because this guy's crotch is like ridiculously not human like at all. But um, so it's inside out right now. So the next thing, that, oh, look, you can see how the collar rolls and lays really nice. The next thing you would want to do is uh, put it on a dress form or on a person or know where stuff goes. The next thing you're going to want to do is get your facing pressed. So press your facing down nice. And I think it's easier to press this when it's on the form. Um, where's that dim spot where it shows better? Is it right here? Um, you want to get your facing pressed down. And then what I like to do is right where the facing hits the shoulder seam. So where, so right, we've got our facing right here where the facing lays down onto the shoulder, take and stitch in the ditch with the machine or put a couple hand stitches right there. Oh yeah, that's great. So, so we're inside out. So where your facing lays on the shoulder, um, you'll wanna put a couple hand stitches or stitch in the ditch with the machine to hold that down nice. So on both sides, you're gonna hook your facing to the shoulder. Then, you can also, if you want, hook your facing 
to the back. And remember, we have two we have two yokes here. We have an inside and outside yoke. So you can lay your facing down flat on the back and you can cross stitch it and just catch the inside yoke so that you're not going all the way through. Or the other thing you can do is look at how far down does your collar go? Look at how far down your collar will go and stitch in the ditch, the stitch the facing right down the center back, but not as far as the collar goes and nobody will ever see it. And then this is like a nice place to put labels and stuff. Then in your front, so we've got our overlap. We'll put it on right side out here in a second. Um, depending on what your fabric is, you might stitch an extra line. You might stitch your center front line in into the facing. Um, I generally don't, in, unless I like want it to look a little more modern. If I want it to look more old timey, I don't stitch that in. But if I've got a kind of a more woven-y shirt fabric, what I'll do sometimes is where the facing lies onto the shirt, I'll just put a few little cross stitches in a couple spots just to help the facing stay folded over. Um, the other thing too that you'll see sometimes is people will lay the facing on and actually just stitch right at the edge of it all the way up to the shoulder. Because if it's a busy fabric or a, like kind of a more forgiving woven fabric, you don't even see it. Um, let's slide this off. The other thing that makes this difficult is the dress forms arms. Don't move like a human. So let's put it on right side out. And we have made a whole ballet shirt, you guys. And kind of looked at another one. I said we were going to get through two, but we got through one. But I'll get everybody the recording of the other one. And we'll probably get through like one in a chunk again uh, in the next class. So anybody that did this one is welcome to watch the next one live in January. Um, but I'll send you the recordings either way. So our guy with his way too long a crotch and his arms that don't move. But I'm going to just yank it up really high. Oh, I popped a stitch. So here we have our really silky knights in white satin basic ballet shirt on a trunk with a very pretty, pretty sleeve. There you go. And we've got our nice yoke in the back, which is a little strained because this dress form is not human looking at all. And we've got a nice roll in the collar. And there you go. You could even turn this into one of those like, oh, it's open a little bit. You know, you can kind of decide what you want to do. But we're saying that it closes. So you'd add your closures there and your closures on your cuff. That's it. We did it. Does anybody have questions before we say goodbye and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and Happy Everything Else that's all holidays? I probably just got in trouble by saying Merry Christmas. What are we supposed to say now? Happy holidays? I don't know. It's always been Merry Christmas to me. Oh, the puppy's back. Sorry about the dogs. They're always going to be here. But maybe they'll get better behaved. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, I, some of the recordings go out automatically to people, and sometimes they don't. So uh, when this one's done, I'll send everybody today and tomorrow. I can let the puppy out. Do you want to let her out? She'll probably go pee. I'll grab her leash and take her right outside. So, so thank you. And once I get this pattern done up in the next day or two, I will get a, this, several sizes of that sent to everybody.